I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Cadence with Amal Barkar. He's going to talk today about simultaneous localization and mapping. So Amal, what is simultaneous localization and mapping? We typically know this as SLAM. Yeah, so good question, uh, Ed. Uh, simultaneous localization mapping, or commonly uh, said in the in industry, SLAM, is uh, a computational problem, typically involves two parts. One is building an, uh, a map of an unknown environment or a space, and at the same time being able to track the position or movement of your camera or otherwise an agent in this space. So you're able to very nicely and um, accurately articulate the movement of a particular object in a scene. So where would you, which markets would you actually use this in? Is this automotive or does it go beyond that? Uh, SLAM is used in a lot of uh, markets and a lot of applications that are existing in the world today. You can start with uh, the mobile phones and a lot of the augmented reality applications for a lot of the self-driving cars. You can see drones when they are moving around and flying around by themselves. Uh, maybe in uh, virtual reality as well, video games. So the list is really endless. It's a very broad usage for this particular technology. So why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. So Amal, what are we looking at here? So here we're looking at a basic flow diagram for typically how SLAM is implemented in uh, most applications that are used today. So we start first with a sensor that feeds in data to a feature matching block. That further is used to come up with the basic uh, odometry, visual odometry, or pose estimation. And then you can do further refinements with loop closure and another stage following that called bundle adjustment. So let's drill down into each one of these as well. So what happens on the sensor side? What, what's actually going on in there? Sure, great question. So uh, the sensors like over here, what we're talking about is, you know, SLAM typically in a lot of the camera-based applications, they use uh, some type of camera sensor as input. But, uh, you know, if you see the autonomous driving space, they use a lot of radars and LIDARs. So, you know, it's typically sensor agnostic. So from a sensor perspective, this could be uh, RGB camera, grayscale, time of flight, stereo, could be radar, LIDAR. I've even seen some cases where uh, customers use like a barometer. If you use the sensor properly for its particular uh, capability, you can feed it in uh, towards your SLAM block. So uh, if we focus on um, visual SLAM, which is more camera based, in the feature extraction stage, this is more or less how we perceive the scene. Like when we look outside the world, uh, how do we understand the different points in the scene? Well, we look at corners, we look at edges, we look at colors and things like that. So in the feature matching stage, the goal is basically to find these specific corners that may be there in a particular environment. So you can say that if a camera is looking at this duster over here, these could be several corners that are there on the, um, on the duster. But uh, when you move to frame number two, the goal is you want to be able to identify, you know, one, two, three, four, as the same uh, corner points or interesting points in the second frame. Now, how you relate those two, there are a variety of algorithms that can be used to do that, but typically for feature extraction, you can use things like uh, SIFT, SURF, difference of Gaussian, ORB, and things like that. Moving now to the pose estimation stage, you take this, uh, these features that you have found right over here, uh, and you identify how they move from one frame to the next. That allows you to es estimate how the camera or the object has moved from one frame to the next. The human brain tends to pick this up very easily with object permanence, but if you're looking at a billboard in a car and the car has cameras on it and you're driving along, does it understand that this billboard is the same billboard in the next frame as what you saw before because you're coming at it from a slightly different angle? Yeah, so that's a great question. So that's where your feature, feature matching stage actually comes in because the goal of you know, the features like SIFT, which stands for scale, um, scale Invariant Feature Transform, or ORB descriptors and things like that, the goal is to identify those interesting points or corners in frame number one. And when you see that same object in frame number two, these feature matching uh, um, uh, capabilities actually allow you to identify that, let's say, those four corners that you saw in frame one are the same four corners that you see in frame two. Once you have that information, you can essentially correlate those two, uh, those two frames and say, okay, it's, it's moved so much from frame one to frame two, from that I can articulate and understand how my camera has moved in the scene. Are you working off of probabilities of this is 99% probability that this is the same object as you were looking at before? Yeah, there is a variety of probabilities that come into play over here. And, uh, you know, the thresholds on that can be varied depending on, you know, the implementation. Everybody has their 
own flavor for the algorithm. So uh, it varies from uh, one case to another. But there's typically probabilities are there. There's also outlier elimination because obviously there is noise that comes up when you are trying to match these uh, when you're trying to map, match these feature points. And that's where you know techniques like ransack, which are used to uh, eliminate outliers and keep predominantly the you know the key feature points that correspond well from one frame to the next. So what else is in the flow here? Okay, so once you have a pose estimation, uh, you have the next step, which is called loop closure. So the goal of a loop closure is basically to identify that you have visited or you have been to that particular spot before. So a simple example is, let's say I'm in this room over here. If I walk around this room and I come back to this particular point, loop closure would help me identify or establish that hey, I have been over here before. So it's not, uh, it's not a new area that it has to determine. And then bundle adjustment is a common step that is used to you know, further refine uh, the, the aggregation of errors once you do a loop closure. Now, typically what you would see over here is uh, a feedback step, which would come from either loop closure or bundle adjustment coming to pose estimation. So let's dig into this feedback a little bit more. What's actually going on here and what's the impact of this? Sure. So uh, as you can see, basically loop closure and, fee and bundle adjustment both feedback into pose estimation because uh, what happens with this feedback is you're constantly refining or updating your, your state estimate, which is basically your pose for your camera based on the additional information that you have caught by, let's say, you know, walking around the scene and building a more accurate and a robust map. There's a couple terms that tend to go with this, one of which is VIO. How does that play in here? What sure. is that? So great question. So uh, the, the terms that I think interchangeably used in the industry, there is a uh, visual odometry, which is VO or visual inertial odometry, VIO. There's also SLAM and six off, which is six degrees of freedom. So visual odometry and VIO, they're, they're somewhat similar in the sense that there's typically no feedback going from loop closure and bundle adjustment as compared to SLAM because visual odometry is more local problem in the sense that, okay, let's say I have frame one and frame two and I know how my camera, I'm just estimating how my camera has moved from one frame to the next. So it's far more local versus uh, SLAM uh, uses a lot more global data because you're building a map and as you are building more and more data in that map, you're getting a more accurate representation of your position, furthermore updating your camera position over and over again with loop closure, relocalization and all those things. So uh, it depends on the application, depends on the compute budget that your particular processor or your platform has. And you know the varieties of applications are different. So if you're talking about drones or something like that, I've seen many cases where they just use visual inertial odometry because for them, they have to build a very large map and having that much data to keep locally is not possible versus uh, on mobile phones or where you're doing augmented reality, it's usually a lot more smaller playing area. So SLAM is a lot of times more applicable over there. Like all electronics, something always goes wrong. What can go wrong here? So uh, with SLAM or with VIO, typically it comes to whatever are the limitations of your sensor. So uh, in SLAM, for example, uh, you know, they typically do a, a combination of a variety of sensors, so sensor fusion. Uh, most common solutions typically have maybe a camera along with an IMU, which is an inertial measurement unit, allows you to understand how your object is more or less rotating in the scene. Now, cameras also, although they can see the world very easily, there are some cases where there are limitations. If your camera is looking at a flat wall like this, well, there are not many features over here. And if you were to just move the camera around looking at a flat wall, SLAM wouldn't really be able to work too well because just using visual data, you don't know how the camera is moving. Other than that, also, uh, there are nice noise models that you have to estimate very well. So typically for your IMU, you have to understand the different types of noises that are there on that particular um, uh, device and be able to accurately model it to further give you a much better SLAM uh, implementation. And sensors also need to be recalibrated over time because they do begin to drift. Uh, what you start out with is not necessarily what, what you end up with. How does that affect this? Yeah, so I think typically with uh, with SLAM, for example, with uh, you know with uh, with loop closure and having uh, relocalization, which is understanding uh, relocalization with loop closure to understand that you have come back to your to your original point, that helps with a lot of cases of drift. If you did not have this, uh, and we're pretty much just relying on, say, for example, your visual inertial odometry, 
in those cases, you could probably expect a lot of drift to happen unless you know you have uh, an algorithm or an implementation which is very, very accurate and is not prone to any noise, which in most cases, it probably is not going to be the case. Another angle on this is the power and performance, which obviously you need as much performance as you can possibly get, and you need as little power as you can possibly get. What can you do here to actually reduce the amount of power and improve the performance? Great question. So, uh, so SLAM, you know, as a as a technology by itself, has been around for a long time. I think introduced back in the '90s, and uh, you know, you started seeing some real time implementations coming uh, somewhere in the mid 2000s, like the DARPA Grand Challenge and Urban Challenge. Those uh, contests were primarily relying on our SLAM implementations, but at that time, you know, you had uh, rack mount servers that were mounted in the trucks you can't really go into production with something like that. So over years, the algorithm has refined, it's gotten more power efficient. Uh, even our hardware has obviously improved. So you have seen implementations going on to CPUs, to GPUs, and now even on mobile phones. But power and performance are two things that obviously are very important for, for a customer because you don't want to have Slam running on a phone that you can run for 10 minutes, it gets super hot, and then you have to charge it. So uh, power efficiency is very, very important. So Although the solutions run very well on CPUs and GPUs, obviously those type of platforms aren't built for these specific applications. So they work well, but they are power hungry and not the most efficient. You can, if you start scaling more towards things like DSPs or accelerators, you'll probably get a much better uh, performance as well as a much smaller power envelope. Alongside of all this, there's been a huge push into accelerators on almost everything involving uh, uh, large amounts of data, which is going, what's going on here. We're, what's the best platform for this? Do you stay on a, a CPU, a GPU, a, a DSP? Do you add accelerators in here? How do you make that choice? Sure. Uh, great question. So uh, I think DSPs is probably a great way to go right now. So CPUs were, are great for uh, prototyping, in my opinion. Uh, you want to get some more performance or some more juice out of it. I think GPU is a good way to go. Once you start targeting uh, large volume deployments, DSPs are definitely a great way to go. Hardware accelerator, I think it's still too early for SLAM because hardware accelerators uh, is typically some type of an RTL block, which will give you a performance boost, but then you are really locked into, uh, you know, however the algorithm is implemented or configured. Those type of uh, pieces of hardware, in my opinion, are best when there's not going to be, there's a lot of standardization to the implementation. So you'll typically see uh, accelerators benefiting in cases like, you know, video codecs and things like that, where you have books of standards of things that need to be done uh, for implementation versus SLAM. Everybody still has their own specific flavor. So some amount of flexibility slash programmability is, is still very good. And that's where DSP, maybe with a couple of Acceleration packages is probably a, a good trade-off or a great combination. And these algorithms are changing almost weekly, right? Yes. If you're on the bleeding edge, it's changing constantly because you know there is research papers that are published constantly. It, although it's fairly uh, quite mature now, the SLAM industry, there's always room for improvement and optimizations. There's better uh, feature extraction techniques, better tracking pose estimations, you know, in integrating some AI, artificial intelligence in there uh, on the feature extraction stages. So this, this is constantly evolving. And aside from the R&D side as well, if you go into the actual commercial entities that provide SLAM, everybody has their own spice or their own flavor that they're putting on there, targeted for a specific usage or an application. So although it's quite horizontal, you'll always find like for an automotive usage, somebody has tweaked their SLAM slightly differently versus what's running on drones versus what is running on your robot vacuum cleaner that you might have at home. Amal Borkar, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much for your time.